Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Powerhouse Podcast. I am your host, Candy Barone, and it is my pleasure and honor to have you join us on today's show. Before we jump in, let me just say I am super excited about the fantastic and fabulous guests I have joining us, Ms. Sharon Saylor. Let me just say hello and welcome to the show. Hi, Candy. Oh, it's a pleasure and delight to see you. <laughs> you as well. And uh, thank you for taking time to join us. Um, as you all know, for those of you that tune in every week, this really is our opportunity to talk about leadership in today's culture. It's an opportunity to remind ourselves that leadership is truly a function of how you choose to show up, how you choose to serve others, and how you choose to take personal responsibility inside that space. And as you know, we like to go deep. We like to have those Rich and juicy meeting conversations around what it really means to be a leadership in that place of choice. And so with that, again, I am so delighted, so thrilled that joining me in the ring is Sharon Saylor. So before we begin, let me tell you why she's such a powerhouse and why I admire this woman so much. Sharon Saylor is a communications and body language expert, officially du affectionately dubbed the difficult people whisperer, I love that, by her client. She is training professionals worldwide on a wide range of communications and conflict management skills. She has presented to notable organizations such as Delta Airlines, Yale Graduate School of Management, and the South Florida Business Journal. She has appeared in many prominent media outlets such as Forbes, Investors Business Daily, Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, just to name a few, and she is listed as number five in the top 20 internationally recognized for body language expert, according to globalgurus.org. She has a number one show on Ohm Times Radio, the Autoimmune Show, and column on Ohm Times, and in Healing Humanity magazines. She is absolutely a rock star and just truly amazing, and I'm so blessed to have her on the show. Sharon, thank you once again for being here. Oh, I'm so excited. We've been trying to do this for a while, and I'm absolutely thrilled it finally worked out. <laughs> Me too. And so, you know, you've got quite a um, interesting background in terms of the work that you do. You do a lot of work um, with clients around body language and communications, as well as having um, internationally recognized, you know, podcast and um, messaging in the autoimmune um, space. And so I'm curious, first and foremost, how do those two things really play? play together in the work that you do? That's a great question because I see them working together really seamlessly. A lot of people go, it's very different. But about five years ago, I was diagnosed with a rare medical condition that's in the autoimmune field. And I was so frustrated talking to doctors and other medical professionals trying to get my point of view across and not just being lectured to that I would walk away from there going, oh my gosh, even with all my training, <laughs> I'm finding these people difficult. <laughs> right. And I thought, okay, I can't, if I'm going through this, what are other people who are feeling lousy and just not up to par, you know, because we're feeling crummy with an autoimmune, what are they going through? So I started the autoimmune show to help others and also so I could learn all I could about it. But the premise of the show, as the premise of my corporate work, is being a strong self-advocate for who you are and being strong and courageous and take not only have those courageous conversations, but take courageous action. I love that. And uh, you know, one of the things we do on this show a lot is we really like to get into defining some of those words that we use that oftentimes can be those words that we hear and we're like, yeah, I get that. Or we kind of, you know, it almost feels like it's business buzzword bingo or something. And, and the word that stands out for me in, in terms of what you just said is learning to be a self-advocate. And when I think about that word advocacy and I think about that word advocate, I know what shows up for me, but I'm curious as we start to really dig into some conversation around this, what, is that, what does that mean for you? And when you work with people around stepping into that space to be more of a self-advocate in whatever given moment, what does that really mean? That's a great question. And I'm going to take one from the medical world right now because it's, it was the most profound for me that I was being told by a doctor to do specific things. And while I agreed that they might be appropriate, I knew for me they weren't going to work. They were too extreme, too much right away. And what happened was I started to, well, in a way, talk back, trying to talk back politely. Yes, I hear you. And that won't work in, with my lifestyle. I travel a lot, that kind of thing. 
and they got very upset with me and mm. pretty much told me to sit down, shut up and do what they said. And a strong self-advocate part of me came out and said, thank you very much. I think it's time I found another opinion Excellent. and left the room. Now, let's see, some people are like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, that's a fight. No, that's being, knowing what you need, knowing what you want and being able to say it in a polite way. It was just, in some respects, I like to say I fired a doctor. Actually, I just decided that wasn't the doctor for me. Perfectly good doctor. I mean, I'm not saying anything about that. The style just didn't match with it. I needed a team member, not someone telling me what to do. Well, and there's so much about that that I like, right? First of all, I love that you emphasize and use the word and as you were having that conversation around, I hear you and that doesn't work for me. And I think that in itself, um, a lot of what the work I do is teaching people to really focus on that word and instead of the yeah, but kind of space, which is very dim dismissive and can be very negative and very defensive and posturing and, and how you're communicating with people. But that and space or and that and space around inviting in your perspective, inviting yourself to actually be that advocate that you talk about at the table. The other thing I think is so powerful about that is when you really truly acknowledge what works for you and don't. And I think it's interesting that you talk about a space of knowing who you are and being very clear about that doesn't work for me, thank you, and that doesn't work for me. And I think having that respect, having that space to say yes and, here's my non-negotiables, here's my boundaries, and I'm not willing to compromise that in that space. So let me offer gratitude for thank you for your opinion, thank you for your perspective, and I'm going to choose to move into a different space. And, and I'm curious, as you work with people, both from the autoimmune perspective and people that are dealing with some of those diagnoses that may not sit well and how they're supposed to or should, go about taking care of themselves because that shooting is so detrimental in itself. That space and some of the clients that you work with, how do you help them tap into that space to truly be an advocate for themselves? The first part comes down to knowing what we want and need. Now, sometimes we don't know in the moment, maybe it's a surprise and surprise is absolutely the enemy of competence. So I say, stop, take a breath and just check inside. Are the butterflies all of a sudden freaking out? You know, that's a good sign that that's not gonna work for you. <laughs> it's a real good sign. Mm -hmm. So even if you cannot articulate why it won't work for you, trust those nonverbal signals from your body, the tingles, the all of a sudden, the tightening of the chest. Maybe all of a sudden you notice you're breathing high and there's a bit of a fight or flight uh, feeling going on for you. That's a good sign it's time to set a boundary. And a lot of people don't listen to that. They just dismiss it or they get too caught up in the words. Maybe the words are confrontational and they get too caught up in the words. Confrontational words are not about you, even if they are sort of you, you, you kind of words. You know, like, and you're like, oh my goodness, they're not about you. Right. Just breathe through it. My number one thing is stop and breathe. Love that. Because it's amazing if we, get caught up in those words. We don't breathe enough to get oxygen to our brain. <laughs> and then all, then, you know, it, we just can't think. It just all goes to heck. What I love, you and I are so on the same page and things, the philosophy of what we teach. Um, one of the things that I talk about is breathe into the fear, right? As soon as that anxious moment, that space to take that power of the pause and, and truly breathe in from a core perspective so that it's not that shallow throat, anxious breathing that's the... <laughs> But it's the really letting yourself open up to your point, because I think in a lot of cases, there is a function of brain not, blood not getting to your brain that's cutting off your ability to think logically versus reacting to something that's not about you in the first place. And truly love that you talk about any confrontational words are never about you. It's someone in a space of projecting out an insecurity, a fear, whatever, and so I'm curious because as we talk about this, and I know I get some pushback sometimes working with clients and some of, you know, people listening now might even be like, yeah, and, or they might be, yeah, budding all of themselves instead um, around that space of, I hear what you're saying and that whole tapping into listening in my body and feeling things out and that intuition space seems like a bunch of woo-woo nonsense to me. So I'm curious in your perspective, one, 
what is the biggest block for people to really give themselves permission or access to tap into their intuition? And on the flip side of that, how do you help people realize that that woo-woo is actually the core essence of how they need to step into their own power and be able to make decisions? And what do you see as being some of the biggest blocks that are getting in their way? Well, it's really not woo-woo if you think about it. I mean, a lot of people go, oh, it's woo-woo. It's not. It's not like messages from you know Venus. It's not like that. <laughs> what it is is it's your own instinct, your survival instinct kicks in very quickly. It's like, oh my goodness, saber tooth tiger, run. You know, so we got to pay attention to those little movements we get within our body. It's all part of nonverbal communication. In this case, our body communicating with us, it's not external. Although sometimes it might show up in our face as a grimace or something. But understand that it's really just understanding the body language, the nonverbal communication our own body is giving us in that moment. It's a early warning system and it's an alarm system and if that's still too woo woo for you the reason I another reason I suggest you stop and breathe whenever you're in a situation where you feel like it's going to be an important decision is that the tone of voice will change I'm going to try and uh, it's going to be sound a little fake here because I'm feeling super comfortable but okay I'm going to start to breathe high and rapid for a while and you'll see that my voice starts to change and it's, I'm not really getting enough oxygen. And all of a sudden, my hand gestures are getting a little shaky and a little weird. Okay, now, yeah. would you want to hear that voice back to you? Like, no, thank you. And it's like, no, thank you. <laughs> right. Well, and there's a difference, right? And I really want to dig into this a little bit because you are an expert in nonverbal communication and body language. And I think that's often dismissed, especially in, for leaders in business, not seeing the actual value of understanding what your body is doing in any given moment and managing your energy and presence in that space and how that can either build trust or you know, destroy trust oftentimes in a moment because you're out of alignment with what you're saying and what your body is doing in any given moment. And so I think about even like tonality of what you just demonstrated, your voice getting high versus you dropping into a space. And there's a big difference when you know that somebody's dropped into a space of power, you hear how their voice kind of levels out. They move, And whether they have a higher voice or not is not what I'm talking about. But you can tell the difference between a drop into your power space and a, oh my gosh, I'm spinning and I'm the duck whose legs go in a mile a minute under the water and I look like I'm all calm, but I'm freaking out. How, how does that impact communications from a business perspective? And why does that need to be something that leaders are more intentional and purposeful about? in terms of how they're showing up and how they can serve others? Great question. I'm going to share a little story to Please demonstrate do. it because I had a woman come to me and she had been at this Fortune 500 company for nine years. She started at the lower rungs and skyrocketed right up to vice president and there she sat. She couldn't figure it out. So one of the things I offered to do is I went into the morning and job shadowed her. It's the best way to see how do you show up there because in the office, she seemed incredibly competent, composed, put together, whatever words we wanted to put around it. I'm like, gosh, I can't tell you here. I got to see you in that environment. Mm -hmm. Because we show up differently in the environments. Imagine, I think, you know, I show up differently at home. I'm just sharing at home. I'm just sharing to my kid, a mom to my kids, you know, which is different than when I'm out on the road working. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not like a fake it. It's just different. I show up differently in different places. Absolutely. And in her work, so I job shadowed her. And within just minutes, I could see what the problem was. To her superiors, she looked like the assistant. She did not look like where she wanted to go, which was senior vice president. She was very demure. She was a very helpful in ways that assistant would be here. Let me get you coffee. Oh, and instead of presenting a report, she represented options to the report where in the boardroom, the other people were saying, and this is what we need to do. Right. And imagine the one person in the room is going, and we could do this or we could do that or maybe this. You know, that really does not look like senior vice president material. So the, the bosses were, didn't see her as a senior vice president. The critical part was then that 
she was so sharp. She immediately saw what I was talking about when I pointed out how even her assistant, her secretary, <laughs> came across as right. more leadership material than she did. We talked about some different things that she could do, such as be very definitive in her reports, be very clear, breathe lower and slower. Mm -hmm. And you know, whilst they stop any of those assistant type things, now that doesn't mean you're not helpful. Absolutely, leaders are helpful but it's different than being seen as that assistant. Absolutely. Long story short, she went back to work and everything was going quite well. And she was excited that she was going to get to senior vice president, but along comes another company that snatches her away right to a, even a higher level. <laughs> and so just showing up differently and the way you want to be seen. And now how do you do that? you look at the people that are one or two rungs above you. So she started showing up as a, an executive, a senior, you know, a CEO. She started showing up like that. And guess what? She got hired as that. Absolutely. So if you come in, let's say you come in at mail room, don't stay at mail room. You look at the people to a couple of levels above you. How do they dress? How do they show up? What do they do? How do they appear? And begin to adopt that style mm -hmm. instead of being but I'll call it just you look that way you stand out that way you look different you look like leadership material absolutely and how does that impact things like credibility and trust and engagement and vulnerability and safety for employees in a culture that are playing together what does it do for those things when you are leveling up your game and when you're being more mindful and intentional and purposeful about stepping into that space of self-advocacy, stepping into that space to use your voice more deliberately and really being intentional about how your body's showing up. And I mean body in terms of body language, how you're showing up to match that. What does that do for those things um, in that space? How does it affect them? You might get a little pushback if you've been there a long time and everybody's always saying, what happened to Sharon? Right. You might get a little pushback. So it's okay if you do it incrementally. Now, all of a sudden, maybe one day you don't want to show up in an entire new suit and all of a sudden develop a command voice pattern because that's what you saw someone else you admire do. You can do it incrementally. There's no reason you can't. So you might get a little pushback at first, but keep strong boundaries because it's not about them. It's where you want to go. And Absolutely. if you've got designs to go from where you are to some of the higher levels, you got to show you can play that higher level game to the people who make those decisions. I know it sounds a little unfortunate about the community that you're in. Mm -hmm. Let's say that floor, we're on the first floor maybe. It sounds, you're going, well, gosh, Sharon, that sounds a little harsh. It's not. You still can be friendly. You can still have lunch together. It's not about that. It's about being seen as different from the crowd at the first level by the decision makers who go, oh, Sharon could go to the third floor now because she is playing that game. Right. Right. And I don't know if you were ever, I have to say, I have to interject a scene. I don't watch a lot of television, but there's a couple of things I always reference here and there, but were you a big friends fan when it was out? Um, friends that come that used to come on um, by any I'm chance. Afraid, I'm afraid I'm not, but I'd love to hear oh, this. There's story. an episode in there um, where Ross gets the opportunity to teach a new school class at the graduate level and he wants to impress his class so much because he knows it's going to help position him um, for tenure and to be you know job security and so he starts by creating this very not natural British accent that he can't <laughs> seem to get away from and he's like because he's so nervous he tries to level up his game in the wrong way and as I'm listening to you talk about incrementally shift into that next level it just reminds me of an episode where he was trying to let go of the british accent back into his normal speaking voice and so he would like fluctuate in and out and it was so unnatural that one of his students even said dude what's wrong with your voice and it was just one of those things that i make that point because i think as you're saying that it needs to be in that very authentic and natural way that you're evolving otherwise people will be somewhat weirded out in the fact that they're like, your voice is this one minute, you're this another minute, you're over here another minute. And it would be kind of um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Unraveling, unnerving to sit there and watch somebody swing so vastly one way and then back another way. And it's that space of, I think, to just reiterate that it is an incremental process as you're trying to level that up and get more comfortable in something where, and I do this a lot, especially for women in business. I find that oftentimes women's voice in business is to your point, they have a very different voice externally than they do internally in a culture. And their voice oftentimes is higher. It's clipped. And women tend to end sentences where they're almost asking the question and it's an uplift note instead of bringing it down into something that resonates from it. And I've been one of those people that's always had a deeper, more resonating voice. So it's always been even more noticeable when I've heard women do that kind of, you know what I mean? And they do that little lift and it's almost a sing song kind of question where to coach them on how to even in that space, almost flatten or deaden so that there's a period at the end of the statement instead of this, high pitch kind of up note question, which is one of the most detrimental things for women trying to climb a corporate ladder in business. I have to somewhat disagree a little okay. bit. And let me Please tell go. you why. Because we want to be able to swing between the two voice patterns. Think about the flight attendant and think about the, excuse me there, my hair, hair piece went out. Think about the flight attendant and think about the captain of the plane. Mm -hmm. When are you which? Are, am I in a helpful sure. mode right now? Well, then I do more of that sing-songy voice pattern. And to your point, do not go on the upswing yet. It just sounds weird. It sounds, you're not asking a question. But you still have more of a sing-songy voice pattern. Sure, I can take a look at that report today. Right. It's a little sing-songy. That's really more of the flight attendant voice pattern. And it's not gender-related. It oftentimes... A lot of people think it's a female voice pattern. It's not. I call it the connection voice pattern. Okay. It's all about building rapport. But to your point, don't, don't end it on that question mark. It just sounds like you don't know what you're doing. Right. The, the second part is imagine you're the captain of a plane. All of a sudden, you're in charge of the team meeting. And think of Bond, James Bond. And instead of deadening the voice, we want to flatten it. And how we do that is we just drop the chin a little bit at the end, and that creates that period you commented on. So it's Bond, James Bond. Right. Now, it's very definitive. Follow, yeah, you could see the chin drop just a smidge. It's not Bond, James Bond, where the chin <laughs> drops all the way to right, my chest. Right. It's not the dramatic yeah. shifts, right? Yeah. Right. But what it does is it tightens the vocal cords, and it creates that little deeper tone, which sounds not open to negotiation. Well, I love that you put that into context. And I love that you actually, one, challenged me in that space and offered context. Yes, absolutely. There is a space where you need to have that very open, um, softer space where people can. And I love that you use the term connection in that, in that and, and the analogy between the flight attendant and the captain. And for a contextual standpoint, that, that kind of flattening of your voice comes when you are trying to lend that you have authority in the space that you are speaking. And so especially when you're doing some of those presentations, to even go back to the story that you just talked about with someone who was giving too many options and doing those things, to offer suggestions that say, I know I'm an expert in this space. I know I'm an authority in this space. There is a space to have that very definitive kind of period, that, that dropping in, that little slight you know, downturn to the chin that can make or break someone's confidence as to whether or not they trust you to be the person to move that forward. And so I think you know, that context that you're talking about are those framings of know when you need to be the flight attendant and be helpful and create those connections and build rapport and have more of that softer tone versus when you really need to take charge and be authoritative and be that captain who, while it's not that you're harder, it is that you have a more definitive, controlled, kind of put the period on the end of the statement, knowing how and when to use both, I think is absolutely critical. Absolutely. The command voice pattern is all about not open to negotiation. And it's amazing. Not only will other people hear that and they go, okay, you said the report's due Tuesday. Okay. Instead of arguing, can I have till Thursday? Right. Because with the flight attendant voice pattern, and especially if you end on that upswing, you'll get a lot of pushback. But, you, but let's do Thursday. You know, it just doesn't work. Absolutely. So the command voice pattern is great. 
But the interesting thing that happens is that when we use it, and I suggest people play with it in front of the video camera or a mirror, and just say things like Bond, James Bond, mm -hmm. you'll feel it internally shift you from a command into a command placement inside you. It's fascinating how when you have that lyrical sing-songy voice pattern, you become lighter and you almost feel mm -hmm. like moving a little bit and you feel your head bouncing up and down a little bit. And you certainly don't feel grounded. Right. But when you use that very definitive voice pattern, where you're very clear on where the stop is, all of a sudden you're just like, Whoa, I'm here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, even as speakers, we know we have to dance in both spaces. So you have that space where you're telling the story and you're trying to get them to really engage in it. You want them to flow with you and be on the edge of their seat on what's coming next. You sort of let your sentences kind of flow and run and there's not a breath all the time. It's sort of a almost continuity, continuous sentence versus when you're really trying to drive a point home. Oftentimes as speakers, we'll take that breath We'll pause and then there's like that. And I, I have a friend who, a champion of mine at one of my corporate accounts, he says, I love how you'll start a video and you kind of bring them in, in this way where you're sort of like inviting them in. And he goes, and then you drop the hammer. And I said, yes, because as you get into that space of here, let me tell you the story and here's the point I want to make. And so there's a styling to that, both as a leader and as someone who's out there trying to communicate and influence people to take action and create change. And so I think there's so much opportunity for people to step into a space to learn how to do that and learn how to balance that out more. And so I'm curious, Sharon, in your teachings, what are some of the maybe initial effective strategies you have to help people? And I think you just shared one, you know, use a video, use your mirror and actually do that bond, James Bond, just kind of what are some other tools or techniques that you share with people to help them, one, assess, because I think that's always the first step, have awareness around what is their natural voice or body language, and what are some things they could do to step that up to another level, especially if they're trying to lead from a place of authority and engagement and creating greater influence? What are some things you might lend to them in that space? Oh my gosh, wide open question, Candy. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Let me circle back just a little bit, and this is critical to this answering this question as well, is the power of the pause. The mm -hmm. pause is where you look intelligent. It's not what you say. Oftentimes you'll run into people who just keep talking like this, and oh my gosh, they just keep running, running on, and maybe they're saying amazing things the whole time, but you're just like, oh my gosh, I don't know where to stop. I don't know what to listen to, right? Yes. Okay. Now, if I pause, especially on the important points, and then I start up again, especially if I freeze my gesture, it's a little awkward on the video, but I'll use a jet hand gesture up here so you can see I normally wouldn't have it by my face, okay, guys, it would be down in a normal place around the chest area. But if I pause and I hold the gesture, and then I start both up again at the same time, mm -hmm. The other person's unconscious mind thinks you're more intelligent. It's mm. fascinating that if you want to be seen as critically intelligent, it's learning to pause and learning to be comfortable with silence. Those are two critical parts about that. Also, we could do some other things about that I see most common is not keeping my chin parallel to the ground. Mm. Oftentimes you see people get in trouble. They're seen as um, too, too much of a pushover, too submissive. When they tip their head one way or the other, left or right, doesn't matter, and they talk from here, and maybe they nod while they're talking, and they nod while they're listening. And the problem is, if you've got your head tipped to one side or the other, left or right, and you're nodding while you're listening, people assume that you're agreeing mm. when, the, when you are assuming that you're acknowledging, I'm here, I'm listening. Interesting. And all of a sudden, they're asking you a question, and they're, they're, they're off running, trying to get that report on Thursday instead of Tuesday. And they go, but you shook your head. Yes, you agreed with me. Right. So that's a common one. So keep your chin parallel to the ground mm -hmm. is really critical. Because if we keep our chin tucked, people think oh. we're shy or we're, you know, we're afraid. It could be all sorts of negatives. The other one is people, if we keep our chin too high up, some people tend to do this. 
I see people of a shorter stature do this and it makes perfect sense because they want to make eye contact. So they mm -hmm. tend to do this and then it almost becomes a habit of lifting the chin up. But the problem here is you begin to sound angry. I'll keep doing this and you'll be able to hear mm -hmm. that I'm beginning to tighten the vocal cords and the vocal cords almost become a little bit stretched and sore and it almost begins to come agitated or angry up here. Interesting. And so if you ever hear someone, and there's a famous politician, everybody said, why are they always so angry? Yeah. This was their downfall was they talk with their chin up a lot. Well, and you saying that makes so much sense. I mean, I'm five two, and I think about, because I can actually, rem I can recall moments where it feels like those vocal cords are strained when you are, because as someone who likes to make eye contact, and I'm pretty good at typically keeping my jaw pretty parallel in the way I speak, I do get what those spaces of... That's very interesting to note. how am I being positioned right now? Because there are spaces where you want to be saying, yes, I'm in agreement, I'm here. And there's a difference between the head tilt doing that versus keeping your head forward, your eyes forward. But this space, that's really interesting to me because as someone who is 5'2", especially in a standing position, sitting is a little bit different, but from standing, oftentimes that's not an option because you're looking at their stomach if you're not – moving your head, but the strain and how that can be construed from a subconscious standpoint. And I think that's what we don't, I don't think there's enough mindfulness and communication around what our subconscious is doing when certain body language things are happening or nonverbal cues are happening and how they might be perceived when people are seeing that conflict in the workplace or they're seeing that I said this, but I'm not feeling like I was heard or how that plays into it and how to be mindful to say, oh, I know it might not feel great, but how do I bring myself back into a space of, if I've got to look up, how do I control this a little bit more so that I'm not creating that tendency to sound angry? Yeah. I, I, there's that balance in that, right? I think that's a very interesting observation. Oh, well, some things I talked to about the people when the people come to me with that issue is, you know, be honest. Wow, you're tall. Shall we have a seat so I can make eye contact? I mean, oh, it's making beautiful. a joke. I mean, they know they're tall. They can see you're not quite as tall. I mean, it's not, it's not like news to anybody right there at that point. Or you can take a step back hmm. because the farther away you are, you know, I'm not talking get distance, <laughs> but you know, it's like, oh my goodness, you don't want to look like you're leaving them. But take a step back so you it's, you can actually make better eye contact that That's way. Good, yeah. And then, you know, I can you know, always, like I said, make a joke about it. It's not not a problem. And now, be aware if you're hearing things like, "Why are you always so?" Mm -hmm. Your body language is sending a message like, "Why are you always so angry?" Hmm. I wonder if my chin is up. I wonder if my shoulders are up. I wonder if I'm not breathing well. Because that's a sign when you're like, well, I'm not angry. I'm not judgmental. <laughs> Quick little story about judgmental. A woman came to me after a speaking engagement and she came up to me, why does everybody say I'm so judgmental? Gosh, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know I, I just saw you. Yeah, like right. I just met seconds. you. I'm not quite sure how to respond to that. <laughs> So she came over to the office and we talked a while and one of the fascinating things was she makes a scrunchy face when you ask her a how question. <laughs> Everybody approaches the world differently and some people on the strength finders, they have the high risk and it's part of DISC and all these different assessments uh -huh. we can do. Some people are high risk and other people love systems and process. She was really high on the system and process. So whenever you asked her a question, she immediately went internal to mm. figure it out because it was very important for her to put it into a one, two, three, four, five step. And this is for the, uh, for the video, but I'll try and describe it too. She scrunches her face up to where her eyes go in and that crevice uh -huh. between the eyebrows right gets here. really big and the lips kind of purse. And anyway, the scrunchy face is what I call it. Well, they have a different term for that in corporate. They call yeah. that roasting bitch face. And it is <laughs> something that I've had to work with a lot of executives because they'll say they're the most open person, but they do. They get that processing face that gets very tight, very scrunched. And it's that, okay, be mindful of how your body is representing. And one, they've actually had to communicate and say, 
you know, this is just how I'm processing. I'm not whatever. And almost make the joke that you talked about before and recognize when they feel the tightness in their face happen and go, okay, relax, relax, relax. I don't want them to think I'm not interested. It's actually the opposite. You know, they might not be able to relax right away. It's a trained right. process that they've honed over years that that's right. how they get the brain engaged. One thing I did was I took a picture of her while I asked her a question, a how question, and I showed it to her and I said, now, if you saw this face and notice I said this face, not your face, right. because it's important to keep it neutral. If you saw this face, what would you think? And she said, oh my goodness, totally, totally judgmental. Well, I've had that same thing, right? Because I know from a, being a speaker, I know that I've, been, I've looked out in the audience and I'm like, wow, that person is so disinterested. And then they'll be the first person that shows up after my talk telling me how amazing it was. And I think about, I've even used to be that person I, when I was younger, I'd walk around the mall and someone's like, oh my God, your day is going to get better. And I'm like, oh, what? And I was so lost in thought because I'm one of those people, I have a permanent line in my forehead and I have the permanent one between my eyes because I get so intense when I'm thinking and figuring things out that I don't even realize that I get that very hard, intense, almost angry look that it's just because I'm so internal processing that I've had to really recognize that sometimes. And it was so telling to me when I first started speaking because I had to stop making a judgment that the person who looked a certain way in the audience was the one that was most disengaged, not interested in usually nine times out of 10, it would be just the opposite. They were the person that would tell me how impactful I was and influential and how they took all these notes. And I'm thinking, wow, your face did not register that at all. So I've had to stop getting in my own head when I'll see somebody and go, I have no idea if they're engaged or not. I need to know, am I demonstrating what I need to, to be as open so that if they are processing, they're processing what they need. If they're not interested, well, that's on them for staying in the chair and not leaving. None of that's my business. I just need to show up and know, am I being as open and as true to, is my body matching my words in this moment and not worry about everybody externally? Because it gets really easy to get caught up in that. Oh, it gets absolutely easy to caught <laughs> up in it. That, you know, even on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I know when I'm speaking to large groups and all of a sudden you see people shifting in the seat, I'm like, okay, am I getting too boring here? What's going on? You don't know how they came in. Maybe they've just come out of another event. You just don't really know. Or the seat is really uncomfortable. I am not a person that sits well ever. I have a standing sort of rocking chair that I'm on when I work. I stand sometimes, even in my events, I'm like, look, if you need to stand up, do a wall squat, do whatever, please do because there are hotel chairs and they suck. And like you got to sometimes it's, look, I have my sciatic nerves going crazy right now. I pulled something last night or you have no idea. And we make these assumptions all the time based on how we perceive body language and nonverbal cues that people are putting out there that sometimes are not even matching in any space of what's the reality for them and the story that we're making are like in two separate ballparks. <laughs> you said sometimes, most of the time. <laughs> most of the true, time. They're, very we're, true. We're not, a, we're not aware of what's going on for people. Maybe they're just had a fight, you know, with yeah, a family member. We, we have no idea what's going on with people. The key part, though, is to reach out and try and connect. Absolutely. You know, and there's absolutely nothing wrong if you're on a one-one -one, or it's a team member, someone you know well, it's okay to go, hmm, no, what's happening right now? Right. It's okay. And keep it in the third person, please. What's, ha what's wrong with you right now, Candy? Right. Well, we talk about that anytime you put the, we do the kind of the XYZ equation, sort of the I'm noticing, I'm feeling like I'm, we're disconnected. It's the putting the onus on you or keeping it in a third person. But it's the same thing, you know, that whole listening, listening for understanding means you're also watching nonverbal clues and body language that if there feels like there's a disconnect, to simply create that pause to say, help me understand what's, what just happened. I feel as if we were really synced up and all of a sudden we're not. And so did I say something? Did you hear something? How did, what are you processing right now versus that attack on you did this, you did that, which is going to put somebody automatically in that defensive posturing. Um, I, I, I like, you know, you seek, we, we make assumptions all the time that get us in a world of trouble rather than just simply asking the question.
Right. And, you know, a, a, an easy question to ask if you're like, oh, gosh, I don't know if I want to go as deep as Candy just shared. That's like really getting personal, maybe. You just say, huh, what just happened? Right. <laughs> you know? Or, gosh, I noticed a shift in, in energy. It, yeah. What's happening? Yeah. And it's okay. It's like, hmm, everything okay? Yeah. And right. just kind of look around with curiosity and come from that place of curiosity and wonder. I wonder is an amazing word. I'm yeah. curious is another non-confrontational word because sometimes if we go too deep, too fast and it's okay, you say, hmm, what just happened? Right. And just stay silent and let them answer. Because sometimes if we go too deep, too fast, they'll want to try and make us feel better. So instead of telling us that I'll say the truth because they go, oh, well, you know, she said X, Y, Z, it really kind of tweaked me. It kind of hurt my feelings a little bit right. or whatever. They'll try and, oh, nothing, Sharon. It's all fine. Yes. You know, it, everything. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm good. And so sometimes we kind of guide people, even when we don't mean to, by trying to be helpful. And I always find that interesting that people later find out, well, she lied to me. Well, what point of that did you try to steer them to that answer? Yeah. Because they didn't, well, they didn't feel good with their boundaries. They didn't want to hurt your feelings or whatever. And I mean, it goes back to everything you just said around the power of the pause being so powerful. It's amazing. And even on the other side of that, when you're asking somebody for something, when they were holding themselves accountable, it's amazing how creating that silence, somebody's going to talk first. And oftentimes you don't realize how powerful that is to not be the person to talk first because people will eventually get to whatever it is that's holding them up or back or whatever that might be. And they'll get to a space where they inevitably will get to that point where their truth comes out when you hold that space to just say, okay, I'll wait. I'm listening when you're ready versus always needing to be the one to fill the gap. Um, I've done that before where I've asked a question and somebody's like, well, I don't know how I would answer. I need to think about that. It's just like, okay. And then you sit and they're like, well, are we done? I said, no, I'm just giving you space. You want to think about that. Take your time. And it's amazing how creating that opportunity for people to take ownership in that is so extremely powerful because your body language is simply, look, I'm just holding space. I'm waiting. I'm here. And eventually, because people can't stand the silence, they will jump in and, and take that cue to start to step into what might be the truth for them. And I think it's just so powerful that that comes kind of full circle around that power of the pause. Such a fan of that. I think especially when you're trying to hold that space of authority and really help people step into their own is how to ask some of those questions. Notice when things are awry and just say, what changed or what's happening and stop and let them get to a place where they can kind of self explore and find that for themselves. Oh, absolutely. And another powerful part as we talk about the pause, if in a large team meetings, if you can, and it's not always possible, so this isn't a 100% rule, okay? Mm -hmm. This is just something to consider. Will it work in this situation? And it doesn't always work in every context. But the person who speaks last always looks the most intelligent. Mm. And the reason is you've had time to gather everyone else's ideas. You've had time to sort of let it percolate, all of that. And that's why if you're actually the leader, of the event or the team meeting, be the one that speaks last. Do not then open it up for questions. Right. Ask for questions first, and then you speak last. You look yeah. the most leadership and the most intelligent. Absolutely. So speaking about leadership and having people, you know, engage in conversations and, and helping people learn more about, you know, the dynamics of their own nonverbal language, their body language, how it plays into how they get to show up. How can people reach out and engage more with you, Sharon, and you know, all of what you're doing in a leadership space? What's the best way that they can get a hold of you? Find oh, out what you're doing. Thank you for asking, Candy. That's wonderful. I have a book out called What Your Body Says and How to Master the Message. And here it's here's the cover of it, just right Excellent. here on the video if you're on there, but it's the uh, cover of what your body says and how to master the message. And they can find more about me at SharonSailor.com. And I have a wonderful gift if you'd like a little ebook about body great. language, just for SharonSailor.com forward slash gift. 
Awesome. I love that. And we will have all of that information for all of you in the show notes. So if you're trying to write fast, you can either hit pause and listen to that again, or we will have all that in the show notes. But I highly encourage you to reach out um, and see the work that Sharon's doing. It's phenomenal. Um, I also really encourage you to check in and listen to her podcast. Um, it is a um, top rated podcast that's out there and she just has some just amazing information. We all know people that are suffering in that space. And so there's just a great way that we can and really dial in support um, autoimmune disease and um, whether it's for ourselves or others. So both sides of work that Sharon works on, I highly you know, suggest that you get connected to that. And uh, Sharon, as we're closing, first I must say, it's been just such a pleasure having you on the show as a guest. Absolutely love you. And um, hope that you will come join us again and uh, share some more of your just tremendous insight. As we um, say goodbye and are bringing things kind of full circle, is there any last bits of advice or insight you would like to leave this audience with today as kind of a final nugget? Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much for inviting me, Candy. I love your show. I listen to it all the time. And oh, I just always enjoy all the expert advice that you bring to the table. It's critically important to bring leadership up a notch. I love and that. I think my big advice is, that this is something you learn as guests and test. You play with it. Everything mm -hmm. Candy and I talked about is higher level skills. You play with it, you throw it out there, you go guess and test, <laughs> you know, well, that didn't work in this situation. It doesn't mean it wouldn't work in another situation. So what Candy provides for us is a huge toolbox of things that we can guess and test and play with. So come with it from that spirit of play and you'll be amazed at how quickly you'll be able to adapt a whole bunch of tools. I love that guess and test. And you know, in order to do anything in this space to level up, even if it's 1%, even if it's a space of, I really would like to do this more to what Sharon's saying, guess and test, it all starts with you saying yes to yourself. You powerfully saying yes to yourself and destroying the noise that might get in the way so that you can step into the space to be leading at your highest and best capacity. Because as always, leadership is a choice and it is everyone's opportunity. And I hope you will take this invitation today to join us to be the leader you were destined to be. With that, I want to thank my guest again, Sharon Saylor. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for all of you listening, as always, thank you for continuing to support the show, to dial in. If you have not subscribed already, please do. We just have a lineup of powerhouse leaders like Sharon who are joining us with their amazing messages and insights and ways that they are influencing and impacting the world. So with that, go out, make your mark, say yes to yourself, and and lead from a place of love with love. We will catch up with you next time on the Powerhouse Podcast. I am your host, Candy Barone, and it has been my pleasure and honor. We will see you again on the next show.